guys, we are a uh, bonus episode of Conspiracy Normal. Now we have rec- we're recording this um, right after we recorded a show that everybody's going to hear in probably about a week and a half. Mm-hmm. So, um, like we we're going to say on that show, there's some time travel. My my head is starting to hurt here thinking about it. But um, th- I have on these two gentlemen. I've got Steve Stockton on, who we've had on a few times before. Say hello, Steve. Hey there. Nice to be back, Adam. Appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Anytime. Um, and also Dan Maslach, um, who we just did a show with. Thanks for having me back, Adam. And Sir Phil. Yep. Yes, sir. And so the reason that I've got both you guys on is that if you, about a couple of weeks ago, I was um, in a pharmacy that we have here in Tennessee, and I saw the I saw the cover of the Tennessean, our our local newspaper here in Nashville, and it jogged my memory that the Dennis Lloyd Martin case, the disappearance was fifty years ago. I think Dan, you said that was June fourteenth, nineteen sixty nine. That is correct. Yep. And, and um, I know that um, I've talked a little bit about this with Steve before. And also, Steve, um, I saw today you posted that actually today as we're speaking, I think is June, June the 25th, it's the 43rd, 3rd anniversary of the disappearance of someone named Trini Gibson, who had, I had never heard of. And Steve, maybe you can also fill us in on some other cases that are out there. But let's talk yeah. about Dennis Lloyd Martin first. Um, you know, this is a this is a famous case. I mean, this has been in the talk about in the missing 411 books however until a few years ago i'd heard politis speak about it i had never heard of it and i you know i've grown up in tennessee i'm from east tennessee and but i'd never heard of it before and i remember asking my i asked my dad about it and he actually had heard of it mm-hmm. so um steve I, I and i know that you're from the oak ridge knoxville area so i know it had to have been something that that you probably really remember. Oh, yeah, it was a big deal. I was really small at the time. I was about a year younger than Dennis. He was like six going on seven, so I would have been five going on six. Okay. But I remember it being a really big deal. So what are the basics of this case? Uh, well, the family, uh, Dennis, his father, grandfather, and brother had gone to the Cates Cove for Father's Day, just kind of a, a boy's day out thing. Uh, they had hiked up to Spence Field, which is a, a pretty good little hike. It's not too strenuous, but it's a long way, especially if you're a little kid, I would imagine. Well, when they got there to Spence Field, they uh, encountered another family, which were also named Martin. Oddly enough, the two Mr. Martins introduced themselves and shook hands, and uh, they had some, some kids in that party, too, and decided to be great for the kids to play together. And uh, at some point, the kids, depending on which story you hear, they were either playing hide-and-seek or they were planning to scare the grown-ups. But uh, either way, the the kids went into the the bushes, went into the woods, and uh, Dennis was younger and smaller than the other boys, and he went a different direction. And when the other kids came up, either finished with their hide-and-seek game or having scared the adults or whatever they intended to do there, uh, Dennis Martin's father, Bill, noticed that Dennis was no longer with the group, and he had watched him go into this little clump of brush. He walked up to it, went into it, walked around it several times, and realized, hey, Dennis isn't here. So he lets his father know, and he takes off down to the ranger station. Uh, Bill Martin actually ran down part of the Appalachian Trail, which cuts through the edge of Spence Field there looking for and calling out for Dennis. And that was at the last time he ever saw him was when he stepped behind that clump of bushes or into it. And uh, Bill passed away, I want to say Halloween of 2015. Pretty and, recent, uh, ab- yeah. yeah, absolutely no closure. You know, it had been 45 years almost at that time, I think. Dan, do you and, have uh, anything that you want to add to the, to any of that? No, I mean, that's all right on. Um, uh, And then, of course, um, um, 
as uh, well, I, I, I tell you what, Steve wants to go in. I mean, everything Steve described is right on. Um, and the store, the version that I have read is that, uh, you know, um, is that the, the three children, which um, were, were playing hide and seek, and the one bush that Dennis Martin had gone in was about 40 yards away from his father. So he wasn't very far. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, other than that, everything Steve said is right on. And then you've, you've got the unusual. Sorry about that. Somebody's chiming in. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, and then you've got the other strange things that happen, and this happens a lot of times if you read the missing 411 books when somebody goes missing. Uh, the weather went bad suddenly, torrential downpour started, hampered uh, any search and rescue effort, uh, washed away any any footprints or anything like that, and just literally no sign of him. It was His father always believed that he was taken off the mountain, that he wasn't there anywhere, that, that somebody abducted him. So there's also this strange sighting people have of this figure carrying something in its hand in its arms. So yeah, what while Dennis Martin Sr. and his father, while they're frantically, you know, doing things to try and find their son, Dennis Dennis Martin Sr.'s son. Five miles to the west is an area called Rowan's Creek. And there's a trail that runs along Rowan's Creek. And there was a family hiking that trail called the Key family. And um, the child that was with the Key family starts pulling on the pant leg of his father saying, Daddy, look at that strange bear over there. Hmm. And when the father glanced, he said, he said to his family, that is not a bear. And what he described was a very tall, shaggy-looking figure on two legs that looked like it was carrying something over its shoulder in dirty clothes, something small in dirty clothes over its shoulder. Now the one, this one, this next part I get a little confused on and maybe Steve could chime in on this is, uh, there was a scream and I don't know if that scream was before the father had noticed the shaggy figure or it was the scream that had caught the attention of the child, which then caught the attention of the father. I, I I'm not quite sure which happened first. I, I think it was a scream, and then, then the father noticed this, what he described as a rugged, hairy man running up the, the hill there. Right. With That's correct. With something that looked like it was small with torn clothes over this shaggy man's uh, shoulder. Mm-hmm. Right. right. That's that's one of the most disturbing aspects of this of this case. Uh, that and there's is that i mean do we think can we assume that that had something to do with the disappearance of the child um i'll i'll voice my opinion first i I, and again i want to emphasize it's only my opinion you don't have to believe me but i absolutely believe what the key family saw um and uh after reading some of David Pauliti's Missing 411 works, coupled with uh, the articles that I've listened to and, and read by David Pauliti's regarding this specific case, uh, I, I, it is my opinion that what the Key family saw and what happened to, to young Dennis Martin was, was a creature um, responsible for his disappearance. Yeah, I'm, I'm inclined to agree. And the, the only problem that I've ever had with the whole Key family sighting was the distance from where it happened to where Dennis disappeared in Spencefield and the distance he would have had to cover. Now, that's saying that he covered it alone. Something may have already had him and carried him that far because uh, 
his father and one of the trackers that was helping look for him actually walked from Spence Field to where that sighting was and found that they could do it within, I think it was about an hour or so. So it's it's not out of the, the realm of possibility, but that was the only. But otherwise, yeah, I think whatever that was that they sighted definitely had to do with a disappearance. Right. And then, of course, in the following days is where the is where it gets really murky. Um, I, I think the, the, I guess the best way to approach um, the strange way that this case was handled was to take it in parts. First, Dennis Martin Sr., the first thing he did, or it might have been the grandfather, one of them alerted the park service right away. There was a there was a, a park ranger station, and I can't remember exactly where the the station was located. But Dennis Martin Senior or the grandfather, one of those guys, went to that station, and he immediately said, "Let me take you to where this is happening, so we can find my boy." And the park ranger, uh, the park service at this ranger station, said to him no, we'll come to you. You know, in other words, don't bother us. We'll come to you. And so that's, that was the, that's the first red flag in, in what happens after the disappearance. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next, the next red flag comes with, um, the FBI coming in. Now you have to remember that the FBI handles missing persons cases 48 hours after Dennis little Dennis goes missing. It can only be categorized as search and rescue. Okay. So the, the FBI does not do search and rescue, but yet the FBI was called in and, and, and it was stated that the FBI was called in because they handle missing persons. Well, how does it go to missing persons in 48 hours? It's only search and rescue at that point. Granted, right. he's missing, but it's it's but there's it hasn't been publicly stated that he was abducted, and so you can't call it a missing persons case 48 hours after the after young Dennis goes missing. It's still categorized under search and rescue, but yet again, and I, forgive me if I sound repetitive, FBI was called in, and they state they were called in because they were uh, they handle missing persons, so. Mm. Um, so that's the strange part number two. And also, uh, here comes strange part number three. Now the Green Berets come in. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I'm a little foggy here, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but calling in any special forces on American soil is actually against the law. But yet the Green Berets come in. They, they operate completely... Uh, what's the word? Autonomously? Is that correct? In mm -hmm. other words, they used nothing but private channels and no one, here's, uh, here's strange part number four, no one, whether it be the Park Service, the FBI, or the Green Berets, none of them wanted to work as a cohesive unit to find this little boy. They all stayed separate and that's the way they wanted it. I mean, it is strange from beginning to end after young Dennis goes missing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you had the National Guard, you had the, the Special Forces of the Green Berets there. Yeah, they had their own communications outpost. They insisted that they work alone. Um, and then uh, I find it strange that I know Politis has filed several Freedom of Information Act requests on this. Can't get a thing back about it. Some that, that's correct. 50 exactly. years after the fact. That's right. And, and let me say this about Poli about Polites. Whether you hate the guy or love the guy. Yeah, he he's controversial only, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's the only he's the only guy in 50 years that Dennis Martin Sr. agreed to talk to. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. That is correct. Mm -hmm. And I if, please, uh, Steve, and maybe you could correct me on this, but I, I think. Didn't Mr. Martin, Dennis Martin Sr., I think he just passed away last year or the year before. Is that correct? It was, it was fairly recently. It was 
within three or four years ago. I remember it was on Halloween, which was my birthday, and I read right. that he okay. passed away. And yeah. uh, there was actually in the paper one time in Knoxville, there was a guy that had showed up at the Martin house that thought he might be Dennis, that uh, he had no memory of his childhood. And I don't know how that was huh. vetted or how they figured out that it wasn't him, but it wasn't Dennis. Oh, wow. I never heard that That's before. That's a story wow, in and of itself. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You're not kidding. I'll, I'll have to see if I can find some more info on that. But yeah, the guy just showed up and he said, I think I'm your son. I think I'm Dennis Martin. But then turns out that he wasn't. Wow. Maybe they did a D DNA test, possibly. That's that's what I'm thinking. There had to be yeah. some provenance there to, to figure out that it wasn't him. Now, uh, if you don't and if, and if you don't want to talk about this, guys, please tell me. I'm I'm open to anything, but... I wanted to, I touched on this with Adam a little bit. I wanted to talk about uh, the FBI uh, factor. Um, as you probably know, Steve, the gentleman, I think his name was Reich or Reich. Um, he was in charge of missing persons cases in that far Eastern Tennessee, Western Carolina region mm -hmm. who eventually ended up committing suicide. I believe it was in 1985. Yeah, And I, I, I told Adam earlier, I, I, I recognize that he probably had a really horrible job, but if it was bad enough for him to commit suicide, w what was it that he knew that we didn't, that is so horrific, you know? And, um, um, there's something else with this FBI guy, this Reich that committed suicide. Um, and, I, in an interview that I heard with Paulides on YouTube, Paulides stated that a, a park service employee went off the record and he only agreed to speak if it was with Reich as long as it was off the record. And Paulides had come across this information and basically this park service employee told Reich that they're aware of what he calls large, hairy, wild men that live in, in these indigenous pods in Smoky Mountain National Park and that they don't, because they can't find them or really control them, that they just don't deal with them. And uh, I, do you know anything about that? I want to yeah. say the employee's name was Mick Carter. Yeah, I don't that's know if correct. That's correct. Yeah, it was oh, Dwight, yeah. Mc, okay. Dwight McCarter. He was a, I think he's retired now, if he's even still alive. But he was a longtime Park Service employee and also a, their lead tracker for, for situations like this. But he did, off the record, apparently speak of these hairy men, like you mentioned, that they knew of, but they just didn't deal with because they didn't really know how or didn't know what to do with them. It, it, yeah, it almost seems... It almost seems like he's talking about just people, not like Sasquatch, like like just so, people that live out in the woods. I, I so think you, he referred to them as wild men, so yeah. you can take that into interpretation there. True. Yeah. Well, you bring up a good uh, you bring up a good point, Adam, because the disappearance of of young Dennis Martin. Uh, it, it really only has one of four, one of four, um, answers. Um, you know, um, human, human evil, um, supernatural, Bigfoot. And the fourth, in my opinion, would be what you just talked about. Some sort of strange, feral, human beings just living off the land in in secret which i mean could be possible and it could, it could have been more possible then 50 years ago than it would be now mm -hmm. yeah that's true now, i mean there, with satellite making drones it'd be kind of tough to yeah yeah and if there's if those people are still out there then they probably keep a tab on them which just kind of goes into some of the stuff we talked about in the show we did with you, Dan. But the, there is also yeah. this case of this ginseng poacher. 
Yeah, I've heard that where um, I think that was near Tremont yeah. where he found the uh, skeletal remains of a child. And I think he like it was either in or he put it in a hollow stump and didn't want to go to the authorities because he was in there illegally hunting ginseng. And then when he went back, I don't know if it, was, it seemed like it was a year later or so, the remains weren't there. But that's, you know, they could have been scattered by predators in the the forest and we, it mm-hmm. is it's kind of like it just he's all we have really is a, that guy's word but it's kind of unfortunate that because he was out there doing something illegal he possibly could that, that if if he'd gone to the authorities well he probably would have gone in trouble but you know that he felt like he couldn't go because of what he was doing was illegal which why is ginseng illegal can anybody fill me in on that or is it still illegal? I think he's just trespassing, maybe. Yeah, it's yeah. just illegal to, to okay. take anything, to harvest anything out of the national park. Ah, It'd be okay, no okay, okay. going in and yeah, cutting down sense. trees or something, you know. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. But is that but that that could may have maybe solved the case or at least knew that the child died out there, maybe not solved everything. You know, that's interesting. I I, I hadn't heard about that. Did, how, did this person eventually come forward and say, look, I, I didn't want to get in trouble at the time, but I had found some remains of what looked like to be a child. Some skeletal yeah, he, remains. He did, but I don't remember the exact circumstances. So under, I think what, everyone's Googling right now. Yeah. We, <laughs> we, we, Wikipedia I'm, says all Wikipedia says is a few years after a ginseng hunter, Discovered the scattered skeletal remains of a small child in Big Hollow, Tremont. He kept the find to himself until 1985 for fear of prosecution. A subsequent search turned up nothing, just as you yeah. said, Steve. And um, this was uh, from an article from the Knoxville News Sentinel in 2009. That would be really terrifying to find a skeletal remains of a child especially if you're in there doing something you're not supposed to be doing and then it's like what i i, I would have made an anonymous call and said, eh, there's a tree month there's a kid's skeleton in the woods yeah. you know like, <laughs> so i don't really understand the the waiting that number that length of time before letting anybody know that sounds kind of fishy to me but the, the whole case is just weird and bizarre and then with the the thing with the fbi Telling the, I think it was the key family. Then when they real, they didn't even know there had been a disappearance until they got back to, I think they lived in Alabama, mm-hmm. and they called the FBI and said, hey, you know, we, this is what we saw and heard, and uh, like he was saying, they they offered to come back and show them where this happened, and they're like, no, no, just you know, we'll meet you halfway, something like that. Don't don't come back here. And that's odd. And then the Green Berets, another thing I've always found odd was they were armed. And just, I would think, I mean, maybe it's some sort of protocol they have where they're always armed, but I think being armed in a civilian situation is kind of a no-no, I would think. Yeah, just like Dan pointed out, that it was all it should have all been search and rescue, not mm-hmm. turned over to the federal government at that point. It, it, it almost it sounds like government. some kind of predator-type movie, you know, where there's this strange creature that had escaped from a nearby Oak Ridge. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> nuclear facilities out there, and it's running wild in the Smokies and eating children. But I, I don't, it just it boggles the mind once you start. And, and Politis, like you said, love him or hate him, he has done his research on the case. And just, you know, it's one thing after another, after another, after another, just all these strange things that happen, a lot of Fortean type stuff almost. And it's just, it, it borders on the bizarre. And, you know, you've got hairy men, you've got the Green Berets, you've got the FBI guy that commits suicide, uh, Dwight McCarter talking about hairy men that live in the, the Smokies. You know, it's just, it, it sounds like an episode of the X Files. Yeah, you know, boy, that's the, that's the best way. That's the best summary I've ever heard. I mean, I couldn't have said it better. I couldn't have said it better myself. It, it, it's straight out of the X Files. Um, you know, uh, Steve, I've got a question, um, and maybe everybody can chime in. The the one uh, thing that I'm still curious about is the lack of follow up 
by the reporter who interviewed the key family. Um, mm-hmm. Because the key family, they, the, 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 the father of, the, of that family was always willing to talk to someone, uh, but no one was really willing to talk to him. And after, the, I think that one interview uh, by the gentleman who interviewed the, you know, the key family, there, mm-hmm. there, no, no one's talked to that guy. And I'm a little curious about that. Yeah, never seen anything else mentioned about it. And that would, said, I think, and if you want to play the name game here, the, the key family, That's I think that's the key to the whole thing is is that sighting and, and whatever transpired there that they saw. Well, you know, the FBI, um, it says here, the, the, the article, that the FBI actually, they said that they couldn't find the sufficient evidence to link it to the disappearance but it's odd to say that considering it's happening the same day it's happening not that far away uh, it, it 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 really that i mean that's the kind of stuff that makes you think well there's some something's going on here something I mean, hanky there yeah, yeah because literally that's the only thing they had that whether it was related or not, I think we'd at least bear checking out instead of telling the people, I ah, just, you know, we'll meet you halfway or well, don't don't bother coming back up here. You know, we're busy. So there's, Steve, I just, I've always remember, felt there was a lot more to it. Steve, do you remember the name? I can't remember the name of the gentleman who worked at the newspaper that interviewed the Key family. Was his name Newman? Is that right? That sounds right, but I'm not 100% sure. I'd have to dig into my archives. Yeah, me too. I, I can't remember his name. But you know what I just thought of, uh, Steve? Um, the show that I just did with Adam and Serfiel, um, I cited three cases in three different parts of the country where the, the people associated in each case never have spoken to one another. They've never met. They've never communicated they don't know who, who each other are, and they live in three different parts of the country. But the one commonality they have is a level of violence associated with their encounter. Mm-hmm. And um, each person in each part of the country also described to a T the same two individuals that came to visit them, usually 24 to 48 hours after their encounter. Even though, even though all three of these people live in different parts of the country and that they had never met or know one another, they all were visited by these same two guys. And I'm almost wondering, would it be out of the realm? And I I think Sir Fiel kind of mentioned this when we were talking during the show, would it be out of the realm to say maybe this guy who who interviewed the key family had an, had a visitor and maybe that's one of the early examples of some sort of interference. That's entirely um, possible. Almost like a men in black type thing with the, exact, the, the UFO yeah. sightings. That's a, yep. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what I was alluding to. And that might be a, a reason that the key family never had anything else to say if they got a visit within a couple of days of that appearing and like, you know, forget what you saw. Don't talk to anybody else. That's exactly right. I mean, Sir Fiel, that, that kind of touches upon what you were talking about, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if you've got Green Berets, FBI, National Guard, and God knows who else running around the Smoky Mountain National Park all at once, um, it, it's pretty possible that somebody somebody got a visit. I You know, I can only speculate, but... It's not out of the realm, that's for sure. Well, and the, just the whole idea that if if this is something physical that no one has caught one yet, you know, maybe someone has. The only reason might be that then these guys come around and tell you to shut up or maybe you take the corpse if one's ever been captured. It's the only reason I can think that someone has not caught one yet with guns. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some of them boys out there can shoot. I mean, <laughs> is uh, on this disappearance of Dennis Lloyd Martin. I want to get to another one here in a bit. But is there anything else that you guys, any one of you guys, want to add that you found 
also bizarre about this? Uh, there, there was some, some child's clothing that was found while all this was going on. It's like a pair of underwear and a shoe, I think. But then Dennis Martin's mother said that they didn't belong to Dennis. Well, I don't know, maybe, you know, somebody camping or something lost that. But I thought that was kind of a weird thing to find. And before the rain started, they did find one footprint, which looked like a child's Oxford footprint on a creek bank nearby and this was later dismissed i think by the fbi saying oh that was left by the boy scout troop that was in here helping search well i i've never heard of boy scouts wearing oxford shoes especially if they're going to be hiking in the mountains that just that doesn't sound right hmm. yeah more so there's just there's stuff. Some little inconsistencies like that but I, I would love to get dwight mccarter alone maybe get a couple belts of whiskey in him and see what he really thinks <laughs> <laughs> and um the, I would like to see if uh, any of the key family are still alive. The children certainly should be. I don't know how old the father yeah. was at the time, but it's not out of the realm of possibility that he would still be alive. With the FBI agent, that's you can't talk to him. Uh, uh, Dennis' father, Bill, and grandfather, Clyde, and uh, I can't remember what his brother's name was, Donald or David or something like that. I don't know if he's still alive, but I know the, the older two gentlemen have passed. I don't. I think his mother's still alive, but just and that was another thing that um, Mr. Martin thought that he had been lied to by the the media and stuff because and the FBI because he hadn't heard anything about the key sighting until he saw it in the local papers, and that just that made him livid toward the FBI and the media for not coming to him with that information because it had been agreed that any any breaking news or any information would go through him first, understandably, since you know, it's his son that's missing. So, again, it's just one of those things. It's, it's hard to wrap your head around it because there's just so many different pieces to the puzzle and so many things that don't fit. And, and apparently um, the family got – the psychic gene dixon involved yeah then initially i i remember she was saying that that she felt he was still alive but that was only a couple of days into it she thought he was still in the mountains somewhere yeah. and he was near water hmm. you don't know exactly how to feel about that that <laughs> that that's kind of you know scattergun approach there yeah he, he may still be alive. He was alive last night. He's near water. You know, that, yeah, that's, there's, there's a lot of creeks. <laughs> you know I mean? a, a stopped clock is right twice a day. So. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Nothing against psychics. I know there are some that have, have yeah. helped the authorities solve cases and things, but it's it's easy to, to make pieces fit and connect the dots in reverse, you know, after something's happened. Sure. So. Absolutely. Uh, so there... <clears throat> another disappearance and apparently this is the 43rd anniversary now this one i know nothing about so uh, you'll have to educate me on this one steve this is the trini gibson case yeah it'll, it'll be the 43rd anniversary this year but not until october it was okay. october the 8th i think uh yeah this just and there's kind of some odd things here just to start out uh, it was about seven years past the, the dennis martin disappearance 1976 and she was also from Knoxville and lived in the same Bearden neighborhood as Dennis. Really? And uh, she was a 16-year-old, uh, I think she was a sophomore or junior at Bearden High School there in Knoxville, West Knoxville. And uh, the, I think it was the biology teacher, a science teacher, gave the students a surprise field trip and, and didn't let them know where they were going until they were actually already on the bus en route. And then they went to the Smokies. That's 50 miles away from that part of Knoxville. And uh, they got there. They hiked. Uh, they parked at the, the Clingman's Dome parking area and then hiked from Clingman's Dome up the Forney Ridge Trail to uh, Andrews Bald, which is just under a two-mile hike. It's strenuous in places, but it's a beautiful hike. The, actually, the climb up to Clingman's Dome is one of the toughest hikes I've ever done in the Smokies. There's places on that where literally you can reach out and touch what you're walking up before you walk up it. Hmm. But uh, anyway, they, they walked up. Uh, she walked part of the way with um, a classmate named Robert Simpson, who was actually friends with her older brother. 
Uh, people saw them having lunch together around 1, 1.30 p.m. at Andrews Bald. And then on the way back, they, they separated. And Robert's excuse was that he went off to track a bear. I didn't elaborate on that. That I don't know if that's code for had to go take a dump in the woods or something. <laughs> but I, I can't imagine somebody going off to track a bear unless, you know, you're equipped to deal with said bear if you find it. Yes. But yeah. uh, anyway, they became separated, and this was around 3 p.m. There was a, another group of students there, about five or six that Trini was kind of hiking along with. And uh, they had stopped to rest. They were about uh, half to three quarters of a mile from the parking lot where the bus was. Uh, Trini didn't want to rest. She went on ahead. They watched her go down the trail. And they said about, oh, a couple hundred yards or so away, she bent down and looked like off into the woods like she was seeing something and then stepped off the trail. And that was the last time she was ever seen. Uh when they got up and started hiking again and they got to that point, they looked where they had seen her go off the trail and it was steep, uh, rocky, craggy, not, there was no trail or anything there. They didn't see any sign of her down there. Later, the spot where she disappeared there off the trail, they found a part of a beer and three cigarette butts, almost like somebody maybe had been there waiting or maybe she took a powder off the trail and had a, a beer and a smoke. And then when they got back to the bus, she wasn't there, which is what they thought would happen. And that said, that was the last time anybody ever saw her was when she stepped off the trail. Now there's a lot of conjecture in that one, and again here it just it kind of keeps snowballing. Uh, Robert Simpson said was a friend of her brother. She wasn't prepared, didn't know they were going outdoors in October in the Smokies it can get kind of cold it was foggy and damp that day so she borrowed his coat which she still had on when she disappeared people later claimed that uh, they observed her pocket comb on the dash of his car which uh, her friends found that suspicious that she was never without her comb she always carried it in her right hip pocket I, I don't know if you guys may not be old enough to remember, but I remember when people carried those big combs in their pockets back in the 70s. Um, but I don't remember him ever speaking to that, but he did tell the family that he thought, um, and I can't remember the guy's name, was Kelvin. Can't Kelvin remember the Bowman, last, wasn't it? Bowman, yeah. He was also a student there, and he had been obsessed with Trini at some point, even going so far as him and another fellow tried breaking in the Gibson house and uh, Ms. Gibson ended up shooting him in the foot. And, uh, <laughs> this is, this was, is East Tennessee. Guys. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> and uh, he was arrested, did time in a, a juvenile detention center. And uh, he had, I think he did six months, but he was out and back going to classes at Bearden when all this happened. And there were students that claimed they saw his car shadowing the bus on this field trip. But uh, the, the teacher, the chaperone, said, no, nah, it, it, there wasn't anybody following the bus. And then the principal at uh, Bearden later confirmed that uh, Kelvin had been in classes there that day. But uh, Kelvin had made threats that he, he was going to kill Trini. And then Robert Simpson had told Trini's sister, Tina, that uh, if, if Kelvin had her, that he would kill her. So it was just kind of a he said, she said, no. And just it, it literally another one of those that just no sense. They no trace of her. Uh, they did find more similar cigarette butts at uh, the side of the road, just outside the parking lot where the, the highway continues through the the mountains. There, I don't know if they saved those or the beer can or anything for any type of DNA that they could do now. They didn't have that ability then. And uh, actually, turned out. That was another case that I followed. I was a couple years younger than her, but I remember when that one happened. And then just a few years ago, I found out that one of my relatives actually knew Trini's sister, Tina. Yeah. And uh, my relative didn't know all the details of the case, but just that Tina's sister had gone missing in the Smokies. So I jumped at the chance to find out what I could from her. And she was very friendly, very forthcoming with information, but she just, she didn't know anything that wasn't already known. 
but it was just odd to get that perspective from somebody that had lived through that. And she said it literally just it tore the family apart. You know, they went from shock and sadness to anger and fighting and, and blaming the other siblings. Trini had a younger sister, Tina, and an older brother. I can't remember his name. And uh, it might have been one more sibling. But anyway, Tina said it just, you know, literally destroyed the family. The parents ended up divorced. She left home at 18 and was basically estranged from the whole family. Uh, she died in 2016, I think, with um, a lot of health issues, uh, alcoholism, things that she traced back to her, her sister having disappeared. So just, you know, sad all the way around there. I, I, no, the mother – Father, may, one of those is still alive. I think the father passed away. But I found it interesting in Tina's obituary, uh, they listed Trini as having preceded Tina in death. So apparently at some point she was declared dead. I don't know yeah. how many years it takes for that to happen, but I hadn't heard that part. I assume she was just missing, but now it's missing, presumed dead or legally dead. But uh, Tina said that that she always thought that apparently the, the the parents were really really strict and Trini was an attractive sixteen year old girl she was petite she was just a little thing like five three hundred eight hundred and ten pounds somewhere around there uh, had a lot of would be suitors like the guy trying to break into the house that got shot in the foot and Tina felt like that Trini was still alive that she just got a wild hair and took off and said that uh, she thought she was out there somewhere still alive, living and enjoying a life of freedom, probably in sunny Southern California. And it was odd that she said that because I saw an interview with um, on WBIR with one of Trini's classmates just within the past couple of years. And she mentioned that, oh, I think she's still alive and in California. So I don't know if Trini at some point had mentioned maybe going to California there was a rumor of an older boyfriend or who knows, but either way, she was never found, never seen again after she stepped off the trail. And other than the cigarette butts and uh, the beer can, there was no type of evidence or anything found. The, the dogs couldn't track her any farther than the, the parking lot or the highway there. And there was no kind of like weirdness, like with like the rain coming in or bad weather, like you hear in the. Uh, it, it did rain. And uh, it, was, it was already foggy and had started raining somewhat before uh, she went missing. But it's just, again, you know, a lot of strange circumstances. You have, you know, the, the one friend of her brothers that she was with. that uh, They had never been an item, apparently, but they did spend time together. He had a car, was a year older, I think. They would go to West Town Mall and go out and eat and things like that. And then the guy, you know, trying to break in the house and getting shot in the foot and threatening to kill her and stuff. There's even conjecture that she may have been abducted by a stranger and that they um, held her captive there by Klingman's Dome until all the other students and people had left. Because you can, you could probably hear a bus leave from the parking lot there if, the, if that's what they had in mind. Yeah. But uh, – if you've ever been up to Klingman's Dome, there is kind of a little cavity under the tower there, which would probably be a good place to, to hide somebody if you had them restrained. You hear about weird stuff like that, too, man. You hear about weird, like, I mean, deliverance-like kind of stuff out there. Like that's <laughs> People hunters? Yeah, well, what did Micah Hanks tell me? I'd have to go back and listen to this, but he, you know, he told me some stuff about something like his brother being followed on the Blue Ridge Parkway. You know, Micah lives over there in Asheville on the other side of the mountains. And he, we, we actually, I think we talked a little bit about the Dennis Lloyd Martin case on that episode with him. This is, this has been quite a few years ago now, but uh, I think he mentioned something that like some girl was getting chased by these dudes through like the woods in I, somewhere in the Appalachians. <laughs> and in the southern Appalachians and it was like they, they left like donuts and trees for her and just like <laughs> I mean just bizarre stuff you know so there could be an element of that too with some of this and, and you never know too you know what's out there I mean you got you know the ginseng poachers but also you might have at that time 
and I mean it still is, but even then, even more so then, where people might have been, you know, growing pot out there. You know, you, yeah, yeah, you, had, you had stumble on something like that. Yeah, in the seventies, I, I remember back. I think this was in the eighties, the early eighties. There was a guy that had jumped out of an airplane over Knoxville carrying more cocaine than he could fly with, apparently, and um, <laughs> he he ended up crashing. And, and dying in somebody's driveway in Powell, but uh, his shoe had become entangled and he had started throwing kilo, kilograms of coke <laughs> off his body. <laughs> and there were literally people in uh, the edge of the mountains there out combing the woods looking for these kilos of coke. Uh, there was one that a bear had discovered, tore into, thinking it was something good to eat, oh, overdosed and died. They found a dead bear. <laughs> So it's just, yeah, it's the bear's it's name was Tony. <laughs> <laughs> Good lord, that sounds like a so, failed. That sounds like a failed DB Cooper. You know, it's, 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 <laughs> that's what that sounds like. <laughs> but that's just, yeah. I just, I, I told a friend of mine, I said, we got to go up there and see, you know, because I'm sure there's going to be. Because there were other things like that in East Tennessee. There was always these stories of uh, bales of marijuana that a, a plane would drop in the lake and somebody would retrieve it. So you had the the save the bales people. You know they were out there, look scanning the well, lake for for bales of marijuana. And sure enough, there were people crawling through the woods looking for cocaine. What was the story that you? I don't I don't think it happened to you, but it happened to someone that you wrote that uh, you you wrote you write about the, this. That there was like a surfboard in a tree in the middle of the woods, something yeah, like that. Yeah, guy that was in my first book, I think he he actually observed it falling out of a clear sky, no plane or anything had passed by. He saw something tumbling, you know, and it was laminated and uh, fiberglass, so it would catch the reflection of the sun. And he thought, "What in the world is that?" It hits a tree and bounces down, and it's a surfboard. It was made by a company called Wave Riding Vehicles out of, I think it's Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, somewhere on the Outer Banks there. And I actually saw the surfboard. He carried it out of the woods and home with him. And just, you know, how does that even happen? Did it get swept up in some kind of strange wind and the jet stream carried it along? Because this was inland. You know, this was yeah. on the other side of the Carolinas, you know, a whole state away from the the coast there, right? But uh, yeah, it was all beat up and had you know hunks knocked out of it where it had hit the tree on the way down. But maybe someone just caught a killer barrel, and then they came out of the other side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Good thing they didn't have their shark leash on, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's... What would have been even better if somebody came through the woods behind me? Hey, dude, have you seen the surfboard? <laughs> you seen my surfboard? <laughs> I, I think um, we're kind of getting off topic here, but uh, Dan, I think, needs to hear this one. What was the one... Um, I don't, I don't know if you... Dan, you may not have heard these shows with, with Steve that we did, because it's been a little while, but uh, there was one where... A guy was out in the woods, and he just meet. He just sees this dude dressed up like a clown, just like standing in the middle of the woods. Yeah, or something like that, that was in the Pine Barrens in New Jersey, and it reminded me of that story. I was going to try to work it in, so thanks for bringing it up. But when you mentioned the donuts in the trees, yeah, uh, yeah, he was talking about finding a pizza in the Pine Barrens. It was a fresh pizza. Uh, it wasn't in a box or anything. It was just sitting there, pepperoni pizza. And it was like, what the hell is that? You know, like a trap is like something like, you know, I'll put a pizza out here. They can't resist pizza. But uh, the same guy that was telling me that story talked about he, the odd things that he had seen in the Pine Barrens. And one of the things he said was there was one time when I saw a guy wearing nothing but a clown mask and tube socks carefully picking his way through a briar patch. And he said, but that's another story for another time, and I never got the details of that one. Good Lord. <laughs> Naked, except for your tube socks, wearing a clown mask in a briar patch in the Pine Barrens in New Jersey. I love that story, man. I love, I love this, this is just, just random it's weirdness. Like some, it's like some sick... As if Pennywise himself is just sitting up. This is like a, an extra sicko version of Pennywise or something. I don't know. 
Um, getting back to the, if you guys don't mind, I just want to make a comment about the Trini Gibson. Case. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the, the one thing that, cause I, I read this and I, I don't remember who wrote it. So I apologize. But, uh, the one thing that stands out is the, the, there you had, from what I read, multiple teenagers on that bus saw Kelvin's car following them. Mm-hmm. And then you've got the one chaperone teacher who was actually sitting up front. So saying, no, there was no cars following us. So number one, she's not going to have a great view if the car is in the back of the bus at some distance and she's all the way at the front of the bus. And then you've got one versus what, three or four. Mm-hmm. You've got four, three, four teenagers who stated, yeah, well, that was Kelvin's car following the bus. Yeah. And so that, 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 that stands out to me as a big red flag. Um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, now granted, um, there's not the, I saw a big eight foot tall shaggy monster like creature, wild man creature, kind of like, you know, like, like you have, you've got with the Dennis Martin case, that's, that's not present, but it still could be, uh, because of the, um, because of the sun, because, the, because of the way she disappeared, the, the, the difficulty in finding her suggests that, that there is the possibility of, of maybe possible second creature activity. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but the, the Kelvin Bowman thing kind of brings a, a new angle to it. And I, I'm wondering if she, you know, if she snuck off on her own because she knew he was going to be there and, and then it went bad. I, I don't know, but yeah. Oh, I've thought about that, but the only thing they didn't know where they were going until they're already en route. But if they knew they were going just not where, somebody still could have followed the bus. And another thing I thought of, just because it was Kelvin's car, doesn't mean it was Kelvin driving it. Uh, there was another guy with him when he tried to break into the house and got shot in the foot. It could have been a thing like, you know, hey, here, take my car, follow the bus, get Trini. You know, it could, who knows? Yeah. But it's. <laughs> and then, then, and then later on, they, they meet up and they do something to her. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I don't think she's in the park. I think either she left of her own volition with somebody else or somebody took her. But I don't. I think there would have been some sort of evidence. It sounds was very... Any... Go ahead, go ahead, Ed. I, I just... Was there, uh, was there anything that would suggest the possibility of another creature? Um, like, like in the Dennis Martin case, would, was... Did anybody see, well, not see, but did anybody smell anything bad, hear anything weird that would, that is typically associated with a Sasquatch or anything uh, in I, Trini's case? I've never heard that angle approach, but that would be interesting. And I know, you know several of her classmates, have, every time the anniversary rolls around, they talk to them on television. So it might be interesting to uh, hit some of them up on social media and see if they remember anything like that, um, sort of a paranormal or, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, heavy, foot, heavy, heavy footsteps or growl, maybe some rock or anything. Those that would suggest- screams that were mentioned, but you know, there could have been yips or howls or tree knocks or like you said, yeah. a smell. Interesting. I don't, I, as far as I know, nobody's ever pursued that angle. Yeah. Okay. All right. It sounds very similar to me to this case. Um, I can't remember the girl's name. So when you guys help me out here, but I think it was like 2004 in, um, I think, New Hampshire. And she apparently had gotten to a, some kind of car accident or fender bender. And people saw her waiting by the side of the road. And then she was just gone. Nobody saw her ever again. And there's some speculation that she may have just like taken off with some uh, some some guy. I can't remember the name of the case, but it's a fairly f- famous disappearance. I I don't know enough. I, it sounds familiar, but I don't know enough about yeah. it to 
to speak to it, but I'll um, I'll definitely look into it. Yeah, it's yeah. I'm not, I'm not I'm not familiar with that case either. Are there any um, other kind of weird cases? Um, I mean, I'm sure there's there's plenty. Um, I I don't know if you guys have ever looked into this, but um, there's a there's a guy uh, who has a YouTube channel. Uh, he seems like a pretty good guy. His name is Rusty West, and he puts together once every three to six months, he'll put together a list of 10 disappearances that specifically take place in national parks or hiking trails. And, and some of his cases are, have already been documented by Paul which he, which he, which he uh, will disclose up front. And then some of the cases he comes across has not been researched by Politi. So I, I've been looking into his, his channel and his videos. And there's a couple, there's a couple, um, cases that stand out, uh, out West. I think one was, I want to say Glacier National Park, but I'm not exactly sure. Young girl, real pretty, uh, went hiking and, um, she went mysteriously, she went mysteriously missing and, um, other hikers had, said that they had passed her on the trail, but at one point they, you know, either, um, didn't, they weren't going in the same direction. And then she ended up kind of isolated or on a isolated part of the trail and just went missing and nobody's seen her since. And so there's, there's the, there's kind of like a paranormal angle to that, but then there's also a more traditional crime element to that because it, some say that uh, she had a, a real short-tempered, jealous boyfriend, and some say that they saw his car in the hiking at the trailhead parking lot. And so, but anyway, I've been kind of looking into some of those some of those cases that have been presented uh, by by a guy named Rusty West on YouTube. And he's got a the, the the videos are real good. It's they're not long, so you know if you got just three, four, five minutes to spare. Um, you could take a look at uh, some of the his his lists of ten. Yeah, I'll that second that. Rusty does an excellent job on those videos. I, I love to to watch and listen to him. He's got a very good voice too. Yeah, he does. He hasn't done one in a while, but uh, he and then every now and then every other video, he'll he'll take w one case and spend a good five or ten minutes doing a video about that about that one case. So you've got a, you've got the, the the videos where you've got ten cases, and then there's videos that where he'll take one out of that ten and go further into that one case. It, the, the guy does a real he hasn't done one in a while, but he does a really good job. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you for thank you for sharing that. Uh, Mara yeah. Murray, by the way, that's who I was thinking of. The disappearance of Mara Murray, two thousand four. Okay. Well, yeah. I'll have to, to further research that and see, but just. Yeah. I, I, there's so many different ones. If you, if you do like Pilates is done and take them as a whole and then start looking at the clusters and just a lot of coincidences, it's near water, which that's kind of a given, but a lot of times it would be near a uh, berry field or berry where you can pick berries, yeah. uh, boulder fields, granite boulders mm -hmm. seem to play a big part in, in some of these disappearances. I don't know again, if this is all just coincidental because you're connecting the dots after the fact, but he seems to be onto something there. And, and berry fields and boulders, as I understand it, figure prominently in fairy lore. Oh yeah. You're, you're talking about the Fae there. There's yep. places in uh, the Netherlands where they'll build a highway around a rock rather than mm -hmm. disturb the fairy people because that's, or the trolls, because that's how strongly they believe in it. But, uh, and, and you have those legends in the Smokies. I did a, a video uh, about the legend of the little people that the, the Cherokee have where there's small separate race of people that supposedly the Cherokee knew about that lived in the Smokies. And that was one of the things they were known for was, uh, heard it called fairy lights or fairy lanterns or whatever, where when people are lost, sometimes they'll lead you back to safety. Other times they'll lead you off the edge of a bluff. You know, it's just kind of at their whim as to how nasty you've been, you know, yeah. you peed on our rock, uh, see you later type thing. But uh, there's just, 
the Smokies in general, and it's that way to a degree. I mean, I've been to other places where you feel that kind of portal vortex type energy, um, Sonoma, uh, Joshua Tree, California, Mount Shasta, California. Oh, yeah, Mount Shasta's a big one. Yep. There's places here in, in Oregon and, and over in Washington where you feel that. But there is definitely odd places in the Smokies, something that I've experienced. And it's it's always like kind of like Trini. I just went off the trail a little bit, and it's like I was in another world. You know, and I don't know if any of you guys have ever experienced this, but there's No, a nor do I want to. That happens sometimes. <laughs> like everything goes silent. I mean, you can't hear the wind. You can't hear the birds. You can't hear the water. You can't hear anything. It's like being in a vacuum. And then you just kind of feel that lift in levels, like literally somebody turning the volume back up. And uh, I've experienced that a couple of times off trail. And that is a weird feeling. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, And you're not the first person that's, that's said that. Um, there's... You, you just enter into these little vortex areas mm-hmm. and it almost feels oh, like one you, time you, you are I stepped on your off way and there to was a tree land. there and i thought oh this is just the most beautiful tree i've ever seen i want to lay down here and take a nap and then it was like you know what am i thinking i don't want to take a nap i'm not tired i'm in the middle of the woods uh, this doesn't feel right and i got out of there but that first initial little you know, this is just so beautiful. I had that happen another time um, out at Von Orr. There's the Sequoia Birthplace Museum out there. Yeah. Well, museum sits kind of down at the end of this parking lot. It's near the Fort Loudon recreation out there. But if you go to the museum, uh, off to the right of the parking lot, there's a, a burial mound there, Native American burial ground. Well, if you go into the woods behind that burial mound, there is a tree in there. I don't even know how to describe it. Somebody had told me about it. I wrote about it in my first book, and then I actually went and, and checked it out. It looks like something that Disney Imagineers created. It's different than any other tree around there. I don't even know what type of tree it is, maybe a beech or something, but it's huge. It's ancient. Uh, there's, It's totally bare at the base just because it's so big and has so many limbs and things on it. There's just leaves there. But you just you get the eeriest feeling. It's it's somebody's power spot, and it's not a real malevolent or malevolence rather, but you just feel like you know, I don't belong here. Like somebody was doing something and they just stepped away and they'll be right back uh-huh. and I better get out of here before they get back. Type feelings. Yeah, I've had someone but, describe uh, something like that to me before. Actually, they experienced yeah. that in a city, I think in Mobile, Alabama, and they said that uh, yeah, somebody else is doing something here. I better leave. Uh, Dan, was there any, like, I mean, I know you've had a lot of weird experiences, but have you ever experienced some of that stuff that, uh, Steve has? Uh, no, I have. I mean, I, I backpacked all 80 miles of the AT in Georgia and uh, I never experienced anything like that. But let me say this, uh, doing the AT in Georgia, there were a few times where I had, or I had to go off trail and, um, it's almost like I remember a couple times I immediately was a little bit disoriented and I could see how easy it is to, to, to get lost when you go off trail, even when it, even if you go off trail just a little bit, because I remember, you know, you start looking around, you're going back and forth and then you start getting disoriented and, Mm-hmm. And, you know, I got a little nervous and thankfully, you know, there was a white blaze right in, you know, just 20 yards in front of me. So I'm like, oh, okay. So I'm back on trail, but I, I can see where that happens. You know, uh, a good case to talk about that, that to, to kind of back up what I experienced and what, what you guys are talking about would be, um, that woman who, uh, they, uh, God, what was her name? It, it was, it was on the AT uh, in Maine and her, her remains were found, uh, only like 150 yards away from the trail. Um, and she was an extreme, extremely, ex- and this is where it gets a little foggy. You had other, you had one camp of people saying, you know, this woman, uh, this woman is a very experienced hiker. She knows she's known what she's been doing for years. So something strange happened here for her to, 
get lost so close to the trail. Mm -hmm. Uh, And what's strange, what's even more strange is that the the area where her remains were found were searched heavily. And Mm -hmm. then then I I think was six months later, her remains were found. Uh, I want to say something Argay or what was her name up there in Maine? And then, but, but anyway, Ger- no, Geraldine, Geraldine Legay, Le- Legray. Was that what? It, was that it? I don't know. Oh, gosh. I'm not, not it, sure. Pretty, it, it's pretty close, but then you had another, some of the eyewitness, uh, other eyewitness hikers that passed her on the trail said that she was acting very strange, almost kind of loony, you know, talking to herself and stuff like that. And, and was very disoriented. And so uh, you got two camps describing the same person in very different ways. And one of those ways kind of describes what I experienced a little bit and what you guys are talking about as well. You know, um, just recently in the news, and I think we'll end it with this, there was this case of this hiker, this lady in Hawaii, this like yoga instructor. And yeah she was rescued by these two guys in a helicopter and this was like right before like around memorial day weekend this year and there's coming out reports now that she said that she got lost in the woods because that she heard voices calling to her from the woods wow. yeah really yeah that's what I've seen uh, that uh, that that she, that she has said, and apparently it was the same way. She had been out there a lot, and she was familiar with it, but uh, she just got lured into the woods by something. Yeah. And I've heard other cases that where people have have gone missing and then were found, where they say that like they could hear people calling their name and they would yell back, but it's like they couldn't hear them, or they could could hear people but they couldn't see them. You know, like they were had stepped into another dimension where they could only partially see or hear things that were actually going on. So it, it makes you wonder about that, especially like the voices or somebody calling name. That almost sounds, again, like the Fae or the fairy people. I don't know that much about the legends of Hawaii, but I'm sure they have some. Oh, yeah, they have like the little people. Yeah, that's that's a big part. And just, apparently if you see them, you're supposed to lay prone on the ground or something. Um, but from May 29th of this year, um, that, you know, 14 website called CNN said, <laughs> Hawaii hiker says she followed a voice down an unfamiliar trail. Then she got lost for 17 days. Wow. <laughs> so guys, just to clear up my information, I was, I was sort of right. It was the Appalachian trail in Maine. It was Geraldine Largay. She went missing and her body wasn't discovered. Her remains weren't found for two years. But and what's crazy is the, the two crazy aspects of her case is number one, you've got extreme opposites on people describing this woman. One camp says very experienced hiker knew what she was doing. There's foul play involved. The other camp is saying no, this woman was loony, weird, and um, the area where her remains were found were searched heavily. And at that time, they were not found. And if that strangeness isn't enough, it just so happens there is a. It's what I re, what I read was there's a um, a, a naval a, a small secret operations naval unit hmm. not far from where her remains are were found. Wow. That so that that's a little strange. Maybe they confused her with some sort of microwave weapon or something and kind well, of scrambled that, her brains or Yeah. That that was one of the first theories proposed that that, that she got you know, she uh she she was uh what what's that term? She was a uh, friend you know friendly on the fire receiving end of friendly, friendly fire. Friendly fire. Yeah. 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 So, and, and they and then, they, they, cut, they kept the remains for and, until everything blew over. Yeah, and Politis talks about that, where there have been several cases where the remains are found much later in areas that have been searched, sometimes several times. And it's it's almost like something's like, you know, okay, 
I'll put her there now. You can find her. Or, or even with like the whole thing, left. children that are found alive, they're found mm-hmm. alive in a place that was already searched. You hear that mm-hmm. too. Yeah. Or and children going up and being miles away. I mean, small kids, like two, three-year-old yeah. kids that are found you know, on a mountaintop seven miles away from where they disappeared with no idea how they got there. Yeah, just recently, um, there was a three-year-old, I think, that they found. I think this was North Carolina. And Oh, I was going to bring it up. Oh, you beat me to the yeah. front. Well, you go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, yeah. I didn't complete it, so. Yeah, no, no that you're awesome. Uh, uh, yeah, and he... I think it was a four-year-old boy. He he yeah. was missing for, was it was it, se- seven to ten days? It was a long time. It was a little while. Yeah. Yeah, he was gone a while, and the first thing, the the very first thing he said, is that he was helped by a, he saw he was helped by a bear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so now one. we all. <laughs> we all know a bear isn't really going to help a child. <laughs> so, um, Adam, yeah, didn't the bear like cuddle with him and feed him berries? Uh, yeah, and he, stuff? Was cuddled, mm-hmm. he was cuddled by a by a by a bear. I mean, Adam, please chime in because I, I want to hear you say it first. <laughs> well, I mean, I know what it sounds like, and but yeah, I mean, there 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 was that speculation. Of course, maybe it was like a. Um, his act of imagination, but I, I, I doubt it. Um, something took care of that child. And it probably yeah. was not a bear. And Steve's right. He said the words he was cuddled yeah. by a bear. Mm-hmm. Now, a, a real bear is not going to cuddle a four-year-old. So <laughs> to eat a four-year-old. <laughs> you know, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's not bear behavior. Okay. Well, excellent, guys. I mean, this has been great. I think we went over longer than the 45 minutes that I originally slated. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but that's content, brother. Uh, so, Steve, uh, you first. Uh, tell everybody where they can find you. And uh, you've got your own YouTube show going on right now. Yeah, I'm on YouTube, uh, 13 Past Midnight, and you have to spell out the, the 13. Uh, I have a kind of a blend of uh, paranormal stuff, folklore, a lot of Smokies things, uh, ghost stories. I've just recently did videos on both Dennis Martin and the, the Trini Gibson case. I've got two more I'm going to do in that series, uh, Thelma Melton and uh, Derek Luking. And uh, I'm on social media at uh, Strange and Odd is my uh, on Twitter. And uh, find me on Facebook, uh my emails in all my books, which you can find on Amazon, Strange Things in the Woods, More Strange Things in the Woods, and My Strange World, which is my personal experiences. All right. And Dan? Um, like I mentioned earlier, um, right now, just Facebook, you can reach me at, but um, sometime in the very near future, I'm going to be um, uh, having a nice big website go online. It's going to include everything that I've investigated and everything that I know about the phenomenon known as Bigfoot, and um, that'll be live pretty soon. And, um, of course, I'll let everybody know about it. Uh, But for right now, you could just uh, message me on Facebook if you wish. All right, excellent. Cool. Okay. All right, guys, we're going to close out this special episode of Conspiranormal. Thanks for listening, guys. (laughs) 